All right, uh, here we go. <laughs> you know, we have one of the most talented Afrobeats ra artists, rappers, singer songwriters, and you know, multidisciplinary artists in the game right now, coming straight out of Angola. You know, raised in Ottawa, now in Toronto right now. You know, Dolo the Gifted. How are you doing today, man? Oh wow, oh wow. The man did his homework. Yo, <laughs> thank you so much, man. I'm good, man. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I got some good news. I've been working. I just left the gym, so I still got the the jitters, you know, so I'm blessed. How are you, actually? Yeah, I'm doing all right, man. You know, it's just like another day and all that. You know, I just released the Noel Ping interview today. It's been going good so far. You know, been working on all these other interviews as well, too. And, you know, just had to keep grinding. And I think, like, throughout this month, like, you know, starting this month and, like, last month, too, it's been good so far with the interviews and everything else uh, coming up. So, you know. Noel is the, the future, bro. That kid got, got talent. Seeing him perform, touring with him, through Gmore was dope. And you can tell he's a student of the game, so I'm glad that's out. I'm actually gonna watch that one the second I get home. Yeah, no, nah, most definitely, man. You know, welcome uh, to the Lens of the Ice for the very first time and all that. And you know, our story is actually very interesting too, even though we haven't really connected as, as much too, but like our interactions were very like, you know, well-spoken, you know, like I met you at the Star Status event back in like 2019, you know, when she was uh, doing her EP thing and all that and you know, meeting you like two years late, later at um, a show at the Drake uh, Hotel with you, Borlison, and also with Narcy, and I think uh, this uh, other band called like Reverse and all that. Um, yeah. That was like a crazy event too, and then, you know, just seeing you like again uh, last uh, month, not actually last month it's because it's February, but like in December uh, last year um, at Bar Cathedral uh, for the Northern Dream Store, you know, like that event was like crazy and all that, you know? Shout out Star Status. She promised me a verse, but she hasn't given it to me. So this one's this one's on you, Star. Watch. If man's blow, and then you want a verse from me, I'm gonna make you sweat for it. <laughs> now I'm saying I'm gonna make her sweat for the verse, but no, shout out Star, that's yeah. family. Uh yeah, bro, we run into each other like here and there, but the interactions are, you know, yeah. they're always in between shows or like, something's happening. You know, it's our first actual, like, interaction, just, like, meeting up and all that. And, you know, it's interesting, uh, too, with the music, like, the Slowly But Surely uh, LP. A very dope project, by the way, too, you know, like, a nice mixture of, like, sounds. Like, you're mainly, like, in the rapping and all that. So, like, even when you do, like, the whole, like, Afrobeats vibe, you know, you're also sticking to your game for, like, rapping and all that. Like, that was a very good uh, project right there. Uh, the song, uh, too, Hands Up High, you know. A perfect, you know, dance uh, banger and all that, you know, for people to, like, tune in and all that. And, you know, you've been killing shows, like, left and right. Like, not just, like, the Northern Dream Store. You know, you opened up uh, for uh, Sean Paul uh, at uh, Afrofest, at uh, Afro Wave and all that. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, that was, like, also, like, a dope vibe as, as well, too. Like, uh, the Hustle Show back in October, like, of 2021. But, yeah. <sighs> the, the way that the city has been embracing my energy has been a blessing man because in in the beginning it was it was strictly bars i was always like infatuated with getting the the, the best bars and putting it in the best cadence and putting it in the best sequence that's what was in the beginning i was always focused on how can i get these bars these doubles these triple entendre slowly but surely Volume one was the mixtape, which you have to only, it's only available on my SoundCloud on YouTube. If you listen to that, Dolo the Gifted, by then I was only Dolo. I wasn't even Dolo the Gifted yet. Um, that was strictly rap. Like 90% of it was just some beats I found on YouTube that I really liked. And I just wanted to try a thing. And from that one mixtape, an onslaught of shows lined up. I had this one show uh, at um, back then was Harlem Underground. That was slowly but surely volume one. From that show alone, an onslaught of shows lined up. You do one show, you kill it, somebody sees it, they, hey, are you free that day? Kill that show. Hey, somebody sees it, are you free that day? And that snowballed into me recording the actual LP. Um, I'm African born and raised, so I always listen to Afrobeat, but I never really dabbed into it until I'm going to see probably 2018, 2019, where the scene started to come up and my playlist just switched from DMX, Kanye, 
Drake, Pac, Jay-Z, and started adding like a lot of Fela, Berna, DeVito, and a lot of high life, a lot of music from back home. And then it just amalgamated into this thing that now I do literally, I'm going to say probably 50% Afrobeat, 50% hip hop, whether it's drill, trap, or whatever the case may be. So that's why the, the LP has the sound that it has. And I was able to, I believe I was able to do a, a decent job of mashing both sounds together. Uh, I rap mostly, but I, I'm a dancer at heart. Like I was born to dance. So I know how to, and I used to choreograph as well. So I implement a few dances in, in a lot of my songs. So that, that, that album, that LP has carried me through today. I dropped it two years ago. I dropped it a week later, pandemic hit. So I had like crazy shows lined up, blah, blah, blah. We're opening for Onyx. We're opening for uh, Dax. So we're getting these shows in these big venues. And then the momentum was coming up. And I'm like, yo, bro, I got the albums ready. Once we drop the album with the shows we have lined up, COVID. And then it went dead silence for two years. And then a lot of people are listening to the songs now. And they're coming up to me like, yo, bro, is this out? Is this, where's the, it's been out for two years. So now uh, I'm blessed and I'm very happy. Yo, the Sean Paul. Shout out to Afro Wave, first of all. Shout out to Lex. Shout out to Alliston. Shout out to Kamiya Mo. Shout out to Igor. Shout out to History. Shout out to Live Nation. And of course, shout out to the Dutty Paul. I don't know if we're going to we're gonna talk about this a little later on or do you want me to go for it right now, bro? Uh, I mean, we could speak on that like a little like later on for a bit too. Let's I just want to get into the story of for a bit too. So you were born in Ango Angola, that's correct? Yes, sir. Born and raised in the motherland. That was probably one of the most humbling, greatest experiences I've ever had. For the first 10 years of my life, I got to, to truly experience what, what back home is like. Because you tend to forget, I'm going to use the word lucky, because it really is. Like You tend to forget how lucky you, we are, all of us, to be in this room right now. I just did a show back home. And you, you, you see just how, how different things are from having the ability to, we can fly anywhere with a Canadian passport, literally. But if you're back home or if you're African, you got to go through literal hoops to just leave the country. It's insane. The money that we make here, you go back home, it's five, six, seven times the amount. And if you come from back home, you come here, you lose all of it. So because we've, I've been here for more than half of my life, I, not that I forget just how lucky I am, but it tends to just skip. Because, you know, when you, the Canadian lifestyle is work, hustle, grind, snow, work, hustle, grind, snow, work, hustle, grind, snow. But yeah, man, I was born and raised, my first language is Portuguese because we got colonized by Portugal. My government name is... Arnaldo, there you go, I said it. Uh, Arnaldo Lavrish, it doesn't get more Portuguese than that. My second language is Spanish. For those of you who don't know, in the 70s, uh, we had a crazy civil war, and one of the parties asked help from Cuba. I don't know why Cuba, but the Cubans came, and the Cubans stayed. Lots of them stayed. So growing up, I was speaking Portuguese and Spanish at the same time. And then when I moved to Canada, uh, we moved to Gatineau. That's where the French came. And I did all my schooling in French all the way to university. GG's, shout out to Ottawa U. And English is, English is just English, man. Uh, most definitely. And, you know, like there was a, a doctrine in effect too, like at the Reagan era. Like, I don't know if you're like born in the 80s or like in the 90s and all that. Because like, the doctrine sort of happened at around the 80s where it punished like leftist like, countries like Angola, yep. Kazakhstan and like everything else too. So did it have like an effect on you? Like, right? Absolutely. Freaking lootly, man. Like, if you've like the, the reason for us moving, we came here as refugees. There was the war was coming, I believe, from from west. It was coming, and every day you'd hear it is getting closer and closer and closer, right? And it was about to come hit us. And I don't wish that on nobody to to hear or to even like experience those things. But when I mean lucky, 
I mean luck, like literally, like literally, like if you play the lottery today and you win, you win. We found a way and we we escaped that situation and we came here. Angola has been great, especially now. It's one of the most expensive places in the world to live in. But back then, like back then, it was it was tough. With, like if you ever seen like a, like a starving someone's like almost dying of starvation. Like I have those. Those are vivid memories that I have. I don't talk about them very much. I'm a very positive guy 90% of the time, but like back home is no joke. So we're very lucky to be here, man. Yeah, most definitely. But like within your experience, like you had like a great childhood, childhood oh. and all that, like a lot of fun and all that, like even back home and Bro. now like in Ottawa. My mom is my hero. This woman gave up, I don't even know, man, like beyond everything to give her four kids an opportunity to live the best life. So back home, we don't have no curfew. We don't, we don't worry about nobody, at least in my time and where I lived. Like I remember vividly playing in the mud till like the sun drops. And back home when the sun drops, it's like 10 p.m. <laughs> when it's midnight, uh, playing soccer with plastic, like soccer balls made out of plastic bags. We did those. Everything that you see on TV, I'm from the village. I'm from Kakwaku, Kabinda. Look it up. I'm saying I didn't. I didn't see a building or like a house, a full house, till I was like eight. I'm saying like when I'm when I mean the village, I mean the village. I used to learn how to catch rabbits. Like you got to learn how to create traps. We used to make cars out of cans. Like what you guys see on TV, you guys call Africa. That's where I'm literally from. I'll I'll bring some pictures one day. You get to see, man. And from then, from Kakaku, we got to go to Luanda, which is the, the, the capital, the city. And then from there, my mom was seven months pregnant with her third child. So I was, I was nine, turning 10. She had a one-year-old daughter. She was seven months pregnant. I don't know if you can understand what that means to go from Africa to Canada in December. You're going to be hot your whole life. You have... Two and a half kids, you got to go somewhere where you don't speak the language, where it's cold, where you can't read the language either, and somehow you got to survive. I don't complain about nothing, literally. There's a problem in front of me, I'll solve it because I'll never go through that. I don't think most people will even understand what that is. To be like today you grab everything you have, you go to China, and you got to survive from scratch. Boom, go for it. But you have children and you're giving birth by yourself so my mom's my hero and she did everything in her power to provide and she succeeded i was like i graduated university i'm the first one in my family shout out to ottawa you will have a minors sorry a bachelor's in social sciences and a minor in psychology so uh i did it man and it's all thanks to her her sacrifice is the reason why i'm here and i dedicate every show to her so Man, and you know, like within like your childhood and all that, um, what were you like as a kid until like the start of your adulthood? <laughs> I got a lot of scars, man. <laughs> I got a lot of scars. If it's climbable, I'm climbing it, man. If it's not climbable, I'm gonna try. I I haven't broken any bones, man. I, maybe because I was flexible, like I got the big scar on my forehead. I don't know if you can see. I got a nice big scar on my forehead right here. I climbed like, I'm going to say probably seven meters high. There's this little wall off the side of the building of my aunt's house. And either I could go around this big building or I can climb this wall and try to just, you know what I'm saying, save about seven minutes of my life. I fell right on my head. Seven meters is high. And I felt like this. I had time to do the whole, oh, and I fell right on my head. Boom. Oh, dude. I've, I got this um, big burn on my right leg from a motorcycle muffler. So my leg outgrew the scars and it all just, but like I, my uncle had a motorcycle. I, I was like a jittery kid. I had a lot of energy. If y'all ever see me perform, you'll get it. Uh, and I and I just tried to climb on that motorcycle, and I just heard, oh, wow. and I was I started looking around because it was so hot, you didn't feel it, and then it came like this. It was a sharp pain. 
I look at my leg and the skin is gone. When I mean gone, I'm gone. It's white meat, bro. Uh, we used to play war. War is like you go on this side, you come on this side. We grabbed literal rocks. And I'm talking like big rocks and we throw it at each other. It's basically dodgeball on steroids. You know what I'm saying? If you get hit by an actual rock, you got to get out. You know what I'm saying? You hit, got hit in the eye. <sighs> bro, almost got bit by a snake. Like, Af- Africa is so much fun. But you got to be careful, man. <laughs> you got to be careful, man. I used to want to be a, like, I used to think I was a superhero. I used to grab a garbage bag, climb on top of the rooftop of our house, jump and try to act like it was a parachute. I was, I had a great childhood. Let me just say that. There's no hold bars, none of that. I was a good student, so it never, I'm saying I never got in too much trouble for that. But that was, I, 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 have, I was very blessed. I never went a day without eating food. And let me say that. As much as we can, we can say I didn't have a. Actually, I did have a PlayStation. So, like, I, I was very lucky. I'm not gonna lie. My mom did everything in her power to to make sure that I was there was nothing missing. Yeah, almost different, man. And I mean, Africa at the time, too. You know, some people like even assume that like there was like nothing going on in Africa. Africa too, like aside like from the AIDS and from the other commercials like happening too until like now with the whole like Afrobeat scene, like Nollywood and everything else too. So do you feel like African culture and media presence was much more prevalent in reaching worldwide back then like with whatever was going on at the time too? Or do you feel like it's more so right now in that sense? Globally, it's definitely right now. The lens is on the African countries because we have international artists who are making insane amount of noise where i'm from because it is a portuguese colony um the brazilian influence was insane i meu coração right every hit song that came out of brazil was a hit song in angola period that that was it that if it was played on the radio 90 percent of the time like forro and other like forro samba and other dances from brazil was what was prevalent in my time it it's not what was globally known and that this is like back in the days but right now right now i just got back from tanzania right now i'm a piano is taking over the world slowly but surely i'm saying Right now, Afrobeats has taken and will continue, continuously keep taking over the world. You know what I'm saying? So I would have to say right now specifically is where we are having a global effect more than more than the past. Yeah, I'm almost definitely. And, you know, getting back onto, you know, getting into Canada and like moving there. You moved there like at the age of 10. That's yeah. Yeah. So, like, when you moved to, uh, to Canada, like, in that sense, you went to Gatineau, and, like, you stayed there, like, within the Gatineau, Ottawa area. Like, what was that transition, like, moving from, like, one country to another and, like, adapting to, like, Western culture as far as, like, the culture, the attitudes, and, like, much more and all that? It was completely shocking. I had never seen snow a day in my life, and when I saw it, I was like, what is this? The the biggest shock, I'm not going to say the racism, per se, because I was so competitive, you know what I'm saying? I was so competitive that I didn't even let it bother me, in a sense. I was, I've been gifted with natural athleticism, and I used that to to block myself from all those negative things. Two things are extremely hard. The language, French, is a very hard language to learn. And I'm very grateful I I learned it very early. That was the shock, because I I went from having like almost all A's in school to like almost failing my classes. Because in Portuguese, you write as you speak, but in French, it is a completely different beast. There was that, and there was the going from seeing 95% people who look like you to reverse, to reversing that to everybody that you see is white, and you can't understand them. When you're 10, and all you do is like, you know, I'm a very outgoing person. I like to make friends. 
those were two main shocks. Yes, there was there were moments of racism, which at the time I didn't even know it was racist because I'm just like, why be mean to me? Why did it do to you? I didn't even put two and two together because you know when your kids are a little oblivious to it. But as you grow older, you start to understand that. Oh, okay, that's that's what it was. And I remember all those moments, and I remember faces too. I'm saying it was a very shocking experience, but I came out of it. I came. Out, some people don't. So I came out of it stronger. Yeah, most definitely. And you know, being like multi, like disciplined, like with your art too. Like you got into acting, dancing, singing, and rapping throughout your entire career. So like, how did you get into all those aspects, and what made you decide on wanting to? become that multidisciplinary disciplinary artist and like taking that craft seriously. I was going to go to the NBA. You can't tell me nothing about it, bro. That's it. <laughs> that was it for me. I was going to go to the NBA. You can't tell me nothing about it. I was captain of the soccer team, captain of the basketball team, captain of the was that you name it. I'm, I was that it was me. I am athletically gifted and I had discipline from the jump, period. My Youngest sister decided to go to this audition for a, um, a brand new agency. And my mom, being the mom that she is, we do everything together. She brought the whole family. <laughs> Let's all go. And while we were there, one of the agents looked at me and said, you're tall, black, look handsome. Give it a try. Here, read this line. I read the line. Fast forward about four months. No, four weeks later. After that, I landed my first role as obviously a drug dealer, you know what I'm saying? And I was, I think, I was the second, uh, I was the second actor in the whole movie. It was called The Real Choices, which I, by the way, I've never seen. Uh, it was a short film. They flew, and my mom is in the movie as well. My mom, they, they just signed up the whole family, bro. I don't know if it was a scam or whatnot. We got paid, so I, I can't say it was a scam, but we got paid. Uh, they flew, they flew us out from Ottawa to Guelph, me and my mom. We landed, they picked us up, they brought us to our, like, our rooms, our trailers, and all I had to do was read lines. And when I saw how the process was, because I, I love challenges. If I don't know how to do something, and I really want to do it, I'm going to figure it out. And that those two weeks alone, this because this is all my like this is pure luck because my focus is the sports. I was in my first year of university at the time, um, and this just happened, right? This is by ch pure chance, pure luck. I got, I got the role and the experience of you know delivering a line on time, helping other actors, just the way a set moves, the lighting, the the focus. Like it was a very eye-opening experience for me and I loved every second of it there was like a, a rush and a new passion that came for me now with that being said <laughs> after I did shoot that movie uh, I got kicked out of university because we shot the movie during first week of exams and I thought it was like in high school well, if I miss three or four exams I tell them I was sick and then they'll be able to you know they'll be able to just let me retake my exams Oh, no, sir. I got that letter. You're like, you have been suspended from your program, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, uh, if you have African parents and you live with them and you get that letter, God bless you. I did not hit a stage or an audition for the next three and a half years. I put my face on these books. I learned how to play football when I was like... 41 from scratch. I had never touched a football a day in my life, but I played every game after that. Um, the second I finished my last exam, I won a, a competition. I flew to Boston. If you fly to Boston and you do great, then you fly to LA. And when I went to LA, I met my acting coach over there. And then I came back. I did my last year of university. I took 15 classes. I said, I need to finish because I lost a whole semester. When I, I think I lost like a semester and a half or something when I got kicked out, so I had to make up those times. My very last year of university, I took 15 classes, which I do not. I repeat, I do not suggest anybody ever does that. I finished, I, I got like, I think I had like a B or C plus, I think, I, I don't know. I, I had good grades all, overall and I finished. And the second I finished, I moved to LA. Most definitely. 
and like just like even being in that area right now too like also um with the whole football thing uh, that was uh, pretty dope because i actually interviewed a uh, big juice uh, like a while back and he told me about his uh, football experience uh, too juice that's the homie bro hey football will teach you so many things about yourself the biggest thing i got out of football is how much these strangers can become your family just like that like i'm talking like after you go through hell week and you're having two a days for two weeks straight and you're banging helmets with each other you're sweating you're cutting you're sitting in an ice bath with a bunch of naked guys bro and like yo football will like you will literally become like this crazy bond with a bunch of strangers you never knew it's not like the actual like football like with the soccer and all that it's like the actual like pig skin that you, have, you actually have to throw like in which the Super Bowl is going to be like in a couple weeks. So. Exactly. And for the first time, two black quarterbacks are going back, going for it. So I'm, I'm hella excited for that. Let's go, man. Yeah, man. Happy Black History Month either way, too, you know? I had to start you as well. Uh, but getting on to the whole like uh, LA experience side, too, for a bit, like what was the experience like pursuing your acting career, getting your first big break, and like living in LA at the time? Was it a totally different experience uh, being in the States versus Canada, or would it be like something similar? My friend. Everything in LA moves 10,000 miles an hour. You could go to LA and become a superstar within the next three months. And that's how fast things move in LA. Uh, shout out to Chamber Stevens. That was my acting coach while I was living in LA. Uh, I don't know if his wife still works for Disney, but she was working for Disney at the time. And he told me, if you're serious, when I went to see him like the year prior, he told me like, if you're serious about acting, then you have to you have to be here. This is where everything happens. And I took his word for it. And I went back and I look, either I do a year and a half of school and then I finish, or I cram these years together. I crammed it, I finished. The second I graduated and I, I finished, I took every penny I had and I moved to LA. I got there, I landed. The first thing he told me was this. I, he didn't even say hi. He opened the door, he went to his office, he sat me down, he's like, he said this exactly. If you go to the South, I promise you, I will not go to another funeral this year. That, those were the first things that I heard. He's like, I've had to go to three funerals because actors that I have went to the South and they didn't come back from it. If you go to the South, I will not go to your funeral. I didn't go to the South. Because those were his very first words. You got to understand. Like, I, I went to L.A. the year prior. It was beautiful. I went to Hollywood Hills. I did all the good stuff. But he's like, if you're living here now, you're going to get to know a lot of people. You know what I'm saying? And then he showed me his screen. He turned his screen around. And it's like the stock market. You see lines of just projects going back and forth. And then he said, in L.A., there's roughly 10,000 projects happening at at the same time, whether it's commercial, theater, filming, music video, you name it, there's at least 10,000 projects happening at the same time. I'll put it in perspective. I got a call to be, um, I'm going to fast forward and save some time. I got a call to be uh, auditioning for Transformers 4 at the time. Mind you, I'm not a U.S. citizen. I'm here on a... I'm, I did not have the work permit. I was there just as a, I like, I, when I'm telling you I took my chance, I took my chance. I understood that I needed to get the, A2, the, the A1 visa, but I had to be sponsored by um, an agency or the whole getting married situation, which a lot of people tried. I just said I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't do it. I'm not the type. Um, I got real close to getting the A1, but the agent that I was speaking with, unfortunately, uh, he got cancer and... You can't be out here talking to somebody like, yo, I understand you're going through what you got to go through, but I got like, I'm on a time schedule. I can only be here for six months. And then you have to officially come back to Canada, at least do 24 hours in the country. Then I could have gone back for another 24. But I, once I got that call for the audition for Transformers 4, I was like, look, I'd be more than glad to come to an audition for it. I just got to let you know in advance, because in LA, if you waste somebody's time, you will be blacklisted and you're not going to go anywhere after that. I told, them, I told the lady straight up, I am a Canadian citizen. I would very much like to, you know what I'm saying, let you know what's up. I'd love to audition for it. Because they, they see my pictures. They saw my reel. They're like, well, you're a very high candidate for this, blah, blah, blah. 
would like would like you to come for this, that, and the third. And I was like, okay, before I come, I'd like to let you know. Yeah, no, most definitely, man. No, it's very like interesting uh, too in that sense too because I was like looking at the IMDb uh, for a bit too because like you know when you talked about like Transformers, you know that was like a totally different thing. I never knew that you. No, I didn't even. That's what I'm saying. I didn't even make it to Transformers because I told her that I. I was a Canadian citizen, and she's like, I'll be honest with you, it's a very small role. And between us paying the lawyer fees, paying your homeland security to get all your paperwork ready, and us just grabbing another American actor that might not be as good or might not fit the role as well as you, it would save the production like some $30,000. So I understand. Good luck. I hope you get your papers, but we're going to have to go elsewhere. That, I will not lie, that was the first time my heart was actually broken because that was a crazy opportunity. It was a role to be like a bodyguard or something. I had like one line, but it didn't matter. And I promised myself I will not go back to L.A. until I have my visa. Yeah, most definitely. But like, you know, when I was like reading the IMDb uh, for Bitsu, which I don't know if it's actually like true with the uh, listings and all that. Mm -hmm. So you were in Siren as like one of the actors. You were in Bloody Bits, Shorts compil Compilation Volume 1. And then when I typed in like your actual government name, you know, you were actually like in a play called... Cinderella. Yes, sir. That so, was like how were like those experiences, uh, like you know, being like in those movies and like even being in that play as well. Siren was uh, my very first project in Toronto. My um, my goal was to come back to Canada, make at least twenty thousand dollars in acting, which is not an easy thing to do because for you to apply for your A one solo without the help of an agency. You have to show that you've actually made money in your craft and then you're able to apply for your A1 and then they'll eventually give it to you. That was my goal. So Saturn was the very first movie I landed. Uh, it was a short film that I landed here. Uh, it's a very cool story. I made really good friends from it. Uh, I saw it in theaters. There's no feeling like when you go to a theater and you see your name coming up in the credits. That was a, like, I used to dream about that moment when I saw that. That was a great experience. I had a small role that was a photographer um, shout out to the Siren team. Shout out to everybody. Uh, that was the first moment that my acting in Toronto was going to start to take off. But then the music thing came and I kind of started veering towards the, mo uh, the music scene because music is in my control. A hundred percent. What happens is in my hands and I can control it. The movies and the acting, if they're asking for a five foot two uh, dark skin, bald nigga to play the role. Like I'm, I'm, you know what I'm saying like <laughs> I, I ain't got it. I ain't gonna fit that description. And unfortunately, and unfortunate to a certain extent, like I'm six two. I currently weigh like two forty, mostly muscular with dreadlocks. You know I'm saying like how many, how many starring roles have you seen with this with these particular features, right? Just, just keeping it a buck. Unless you're in Atlanta, that's different. Right. So but in music, I can just do whatever I want. I'm in control. I can drop whenever I want. I can make whatever type of music I want. So that's when the, the, the transition from the acting to the music started to happen. Cinderella was an opportunity. Shout out to Sasha. Shout out to Vanessa. Um, was an opportunity to do a play. There's a big difference between movies and theater. Theater, you have to project. In movies, you can talk like this. You can relax. You can even you can borderline whisper because you have you're plugged in all over your mics and you have to really convey the emotion through a screen. But in a play, you have to be able to project, not scream. There's a big difference. You have to be able to project the way your body is positioned. How you can't turn your back to the crowd, and it comes through just experience and repetition. You know, I did theater before in high school and also through my classes that I took in Hollywood. Uh, you learn about theater as well. That was an opportunity that came very last minute, but it was absolutely phenomenal. I would do it 10 times over. To see an all-black cast portraying an African version of Cinderella, especially here, homegrown Toronto, it was insane. The response was dope. We had some pretty big names that showed up. And I hope to God we keep doing it. People were thinking about taking us on tour. They'd be like, you guys should take this show on tour. It was crazy. It was nice. So I love the opportunity to, like, acting will forever be a part of me. Like, I still I shot, like, three commercials. I shot a Tim Hortons commercials. I shot a, 
uh, BMO commercial. Like whenever these things land on my lap, I still take them because one, it's incredibly good money, and two, I still love the the studio time, the the wait. That's that's the name of the game: sit and wait. Because trust me, a three hour, uh, a fifteen second like promotion is about like four to five hours worth of work. Yeah, nah, most definitely not. And you know, getting into more of the music aspect, like of your stuff and all that, uh, what's your creative process when you're making music or when you're dancing? And what would a day in like making music or doing other content be like for you? Repetition, 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 repetition. Shout out Lil Wayne. I need a hook. My strongest asset as a musician is to find something that people will grab a hold to and be able to repeat it instinctively with me on stage. My style is very much a reactive style. I create with the purpose of performing. It took a long time to be able to develop that skill. I'm talking like, I'm gonna say probably like 800 hours of freestyles. Like just off the head, just freestyling, freestyling. Me and my boy Kenny, RP Kenny, me and Kenny and, and Boogie, we used to freestyle from Ottawa to Toronto and from Toronto to Ottawa. The second we sit in a car, play a beat, and you gotta go off the dome for the four hours. And I mean nonstop, and we used to record everything. One day, God willing, if there's a documentary, I'm gonna pull out all of these crazy uh, freestyles. And that's how music started. We like, it's been a journey, but I write with the purpose of performance. Out of 10 songs, out of, let's say out of 10 songs, at least eight of them will have that, that purpose. So I need my hook first. I listen to any beat and the beat tells, the beat tells me what to write. I don't need to be sad to write a sad song. If it's a sad beat, I can very much, I don't know if it's because of my acting, I can just tap into whatever sadness I have at the moment and I can apply it onto the paper. If the beat is a hype beat, I can tap into that. If the beat is a love, if, if I hear love, like a love song coming from it, I just go from it. I don't have to be in a certain mood. You don't have to dim the lights. You don't have to turn on the lights. I don't have to be outside or in a garden. Whatever the instruments convey in me, I apply it on paper. That's the first thing. Secondly, the verse. I would have to say you would have to really get the lyrical aspect out of me depending on, on the BPMs of the beat. If it's the type of beat that allows me to really go incredibly and be intricate with the wordplay, then I will use it. But if it's a hype and fun beat, I don't even think about it. It's, I just start seeing and then my hand goes and then it just happens. But repetition, 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 repetition. I can write a song in 10 minutes, but I'd rather write it in 10 hours. No, most definitely. And I know with some artists too, um, you know, usually they want to blaze up or, you know, they want to be like in that element, you know, like they'll do like some licks and all that to kind of be in that element. Are you like on that type of vibe or like? I don't smoke. I don't drink. I've never been drunk. I've never been high. I've never tried no drug. The toughest thing I ever took was Tylenol 3 when I had to get my, my teeth ripped out of my freaking mouth, bro. Oh, the wisdom teeth. Bro, my brother. My brother. That was, when I'm telling you a grown man was on his knees, bro, I was on my knees. And I'm, I'm calling for my mother, bro. I'm on my knees and like my mouth is full of water. I went to like to the dentist. They were like, yo, it's like 2,500 a tooth to do a crown. I'm like, bro, I was trying to get, I went to the bank, bro. I went to the bank. I was telling them like, yo, I don't care. I need 10 racks today. I'll pay it tomorrow. I am not going through this pain again. And then the doctor, the, like I went to see the dentist. like, you know, you don't need these to eat, right? I'm like, what? You don't need these teeth in your mouth for you to eat. And I'm like, yo, take them. Take them shits off, bro. Like, what do you mean? And then it brought everything down to like $900. And I'm like, yeah, whatever, man. Set it up. And I had the option to either go to sleep or to stay up and watch this happen. If I'm spending $900 for you to rip out my teeth, I want to learn this lesson. Floss, nigga. 
So. Yeah. Nah, for sure, man. And also, uh, too, um, I know that we talked about the Sully, but surely EP, LP, like, in the beginning and all that, but I want to talk about, like, your latest single that you have, like, last year, Hands Up High. What was, like, that process creatively for that single, and what want you to, like, what inspired you to, to like, do that track in that sense? Shout out to the boy Leon Suave. Um, he's probably one of the other, the only other Angolans that I know. Uh... He's a Afrobeat producer. Well, he, sorry, he's a producer, period. Whatever you want, he has it. We were just linking, bro. We're just talking. Because I run, uh, I do security. I run my own security company as well. I got like four jobs, bro. Like, if you want to live in Toronto, you ain't got no choice. So I run my own security company, and uh, I guess we we're doing a shift. And then after the shift, he's like, yo, I got beats, bro. I'm like, say less. Went to his car, and he started playing the beat. And I'm like, yo, bro. Send me this. I'm going to drop this in two weeks. And I told him, because Carabana was right around the corner. And I was like, bro, this song, this beat goes perfectly with the Carabana vibe. And I can come up with a choreo for this in seconds. He's like, you bet. Send me the beat. I wrote the song literally, I think, if not that night, like the following day. I hit the studio. Uh, shout out Nate Smith. I hit the studio with Leon probably like three or four days after. Mixed, mastered, and I dropped. This is the fastest song I've ever dropped. Usually, I like to be a little bit more meticulous. I like to put projects together, drop it, and then my strength is performing. Then I perform them out. But I dropped it. Uh, also, I had the Sean Paul show coming up, and I'm like, bro, I got to, I got to, this, this needs to come out now because this fits perfectly with the environment that we have. And, you know, just put your hands up high, reach for the sky, bring them down slow till you touch your thighs, tick tock slow, go rewind that clock on the dance floor when I see it, what you got, now put your hands up, bro. The, like, I'm going to tell you this, the choreography aspect of it, these things, they just come to me. I give it to the almighty for that man. nah for sure man and i think this is actually like one of my favorite questions that i want to ask because with him knowing him uh, for a while too with borlison and all that you know you guys have a great friendship and all that like even with fearless and even with everything else too and like i've noticed that too for the from the interactions that i've met up with borlison and all that but how did you and borlison meet i uh, met and tell me more about that friendship and work and that working relationship with him and what was that experience like uh, and the impact, you know, like working with him on one of his like biggest records, Fearless? I believe every artist has that, that one other peer that makes you go harder, that, make, that pushes to go harder. I met Borelson when he was introducing uh, his project, uh, as far as the eye can see. He was showing the video for The Vision, and it was showing the video for Down to Row, which is one of my favorite songs from him. Uh, Boogie hit me up, was like, yo, this guy Borussen's doing a, a thing, let's go. At the time, I had no idea who he was. But you will see me at random events. One, I love music, so I will go to local shows, whether I know the artist or not, and I will sit and I will watch and I will enjoy, I enjoy music, so that's what I do. So he's like, is this guy, he's putting on some music, so shout out Boogie for that. I went there, and I heard the vision, the video was dope, a nice little compact room, bro, that was packed, and then Down to Roll came, and I was like, that's a banger, bro. Till this day, Down to Roll is one of my favorite songs, and I will do a remix to that song one day, watch. Um, and from then on, bro, I follow him, and he's like, yo, you're Dola the Gift. It was like, I'm like, yeah, man, because I, I think Cele me and Dami had just released Celebrate at the time, and Celebrate was making, was making a little bit of noise. And then he knew who I was, and then we just clicked from there. And then he's like, yo, I think he wanted um, somebody with a different language to be on uh, Ubuntu, which is one of his songs to the album, as far as the eye can see, right? So... I was featuring uh, myself as Zen Soul. Shout out Zen. And that's where the first link up happened. He sent me the beat. I wrote to it. Uh, then that's through him. That's actually how I met Nate Smith, which is actually one of my pr pretty much the only guy I go to record at, at these days. Through him, I met Nate. I heard of Nate Smith, but I never had a chance to, to work with him. So Borelson took me to the studio. We dropped the verse and then we performed it together at AfroFest. 
And any show that he had that he performed Ubuntu, Borelson made sure to invite me. And then we just started developing this friendship. Now, Fearless. We were shooting for uh, Dance Some More, DJ Damager featuring myself and Zen Soul. And Borelson, the good guy that he is, showed up to the music video shoot. And he's like, yo, bro, I'm coming up with a track. Listen. And then he put those two earbuds in my ear and my head just started going, bro. And I told him, bro, if you don't put me in this fucking song, my G, yeah, we're man. fighting, dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I told him, yo, fam, it was one of those moments, I'm like, yo, fam, if you don't put me in this fucking song, bro, we're done. It's a wrap. You sent it to me the next day. I'm willing to be journalist, so we'll never stop the winning. Looking deeper than engineer, we'll never stop the digging. If you get beefy barbecue, we'll never stop the grilling. We got the sauce, we got the juice, you know what we're chilling. You're feeling the willing to listen, look at what we're filming. The woman we're kissing, the whip a lover when we're dripping. Cooking and riding in the kitchen, recipe for bills. Flipping and stacking what is given, gonna break the silly fee. Five, four, you do that, we want more. I forgot to tow, row, tow, get a house or comp. Yo, listen to Fearless by Borelson. Trust me, yo. IMI did his thing, TB did his thing, and Borelsa did his thing. By far, top five records I've ever written. Yeah, nah, for real, man. Like, that's actually, like, a good reel uh, right there, too, because right now I'm doing the shorts uh, for a bit, too, and, you know, I just uh, posted uh, Noel's one, and I think your performance uh, right here, you know, I'm, I got to do that as a short either way, you know? Bro, it, it, tell me the song isn't good, bro. Yeah, it's fire either way, you know? He the, slaps. The racism, like, Everything else, too. Like, I heard it at... um. You know, like, at a lot of events, too, and, like, after, like, hearing it, like, at the 40 ounce uh, Hero thing, and then also, like, tapping in, like, watching the video, and seeing, like, hearing it on CBC, too, like, that was, like, way too legendary, you know? Like, even, like, within that sense, too, like, you know, all praise to the most high either way, you know? Bro, Brussels one of the hardest working artists in the city. Any show that I have that I can bring him on, that's why I brought him on uh on the sean paul show bro anytime that i have a big show he's there with me mandatory mandatory that's my guy for life no joke and honestly like that loyalty is real like that's like an infinity uh, link too because i know if you guys like you're always gonna perform too like i don't know if you know the story about uh you know lola brooks she's like this rising uh, new york rapper you know don't play with it don't play with it exactly. don't play with it yeah <laughs> because there were some rumors a while back that you know she's not bringing her other half uh, billy b to perform at the new york shows and all that so you know, it's kind of interesting uh, to like how stuff like that can happen. But like with you and Borlison, you know, like you always ha are like one call away, one text away. What? Anything the man wants is 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 yeah. all like legit. He whatever Borlison needs from me, because it's vice versa, bro. And I'm saying I got a and I got a few. I got a song that I need to to send to him. Actually, I gotta I gotta get that. I gotta get that done. Well, Stephanie, man, I just have uh, some of these uh, questions uh, out for a bit too. So, um. You know, to speak more on the performance aspect, what made you enjoy that? And, you know, let's dive into more on the whole Sean Paul thing. I am a dance. My first art was always dance. I get that from my mom, probably. That was my very first expression of art was through dancing. I was even in a dance group called Diverse in Ottawa. Ottawa's elite dance troupe. Those were the days. Those are some fun days. That was my very first time taking a professional approach. That was my first time getting paid for any artistic um, contribution, right? So dancing was always a part of me. So when you do a power move and the crowd goes, ah. When you do a power move and the crowd goes crazy, that adrenaline just shoots up, right? So that's how the performing aspect comes. That's why I write with the intention of me being on stage and how the crowd, yo, when I go like, everybody got to listen when I'm cooking in the kitchen because I'm whipping and I'm whipping my name, making it as a vision, getting stronger by the minimum, believing that we're putting, you're winning, you're winning, bringing books to the decision, so... I'm saying like when I do these, when I write these things, I'm like, ooh, if we drop the beat completely at zero and they see me go a cappella extremely fast, the crowd's going to go nuts. And sure enough, through a lot of experience, a lot of trial and error, I'm saying surely enough, when it happens, you hear it. 
it goes quiet and all you hear is me go crazy and then you just hear the crowd go oh and so that's where the like i i that as an athlete when you hit that that three-pointer you get that adrenaline as an artist that's where i get stuff and uh with the whole uh sean paul thing to yona speak shout out to afro wave shout out to lex that was crazy uh we didn't he i just got an email hey we're doing a showcase uh, are you interested? I'm like, absolutely, I'm interested. Say yes. A month later, the flyer drops. Boom. I see Sean Paul. And I'm like, okay, I don't know why I'm getting this. Click to the next picture. And history. I'm like, oh, sick. And then I swipe and I see my face. Dogs. I, I lost my mind, bro. I'm like, is this for reals? Y'all are telling me all this hard work is going to... Is gonna pay off in the biggest way. If you don't know Sean Paul, Sean Paul is the reason why we all like bubbled for like forever. If you don't know, Sha I'm saying that's a like a mega Grammy award winning superstar. You can't tell that man nothing, and I get to open for him in one of the best venues in the city. And I'm serious when I say that. When it comes to sound, which throughout the years and doing shows and. Lord, and places you won't even imagine. Doing shows almost everywhere, by far, that is one of the best synetically and phonetically like stages I've ever been on. The production was insane. That was beautiful, man. I think, thanks, thanks, Alpha Wave again for that. I hope we can do it again. Most definitely. And, you know, let's speak more on the whole like Northern Dream so tour for a bit. So, how did you manage to be on there, like, as like the main headliner and as a touring artist? And how was that experience like being on that tour and that impact it had for you? Relationships are key, man. Relationships are everything. Shout out to Danica. Shout out to Depp. Shout out to the whole Dream More squad, man. So, First things first, I think it was back in 20, I'm going to give 2019, uh, one of the DJ's bars gave me a call. It's like, yo, bro, I got a show. They're not paying much. You down? I'm like, obviously I'm down. Went, we did it. We killed it. We just stopped talking to each other. Like, that was the very first time we was a Christmas show. We just literally stopped talking because I don't know whatever happened. And then I just got a random call from her one day. He's like, hey, I got a showcase. You down? I'm like, absolutely. Went. Now... I had the album. When she called me, I only had the mixtape. Now that she called me, I had the album. I had Whoop. I had Danse Bouger. I had Celebrate. Like, we had actual bangers. And then after that first one, she's like, yo, you absolutely clobbered this. We did, like, I think, I'm going to say maybe five, five shows through Dream More. And then that relationship that we had, we just kept seeing like yo if you need me to sell a certain amount of tickets with this with the years that we've had i i have to say i'm thankful that i'm able to like when i call upon my people to show up for a show they show up for a show so that has been a blessing so through that we just like yo bro you're killing the show and we got a tour coming and you're going to be one of the headliners and then boom and through that relationship we're going to the u.s my very first U.S. tour is coming this March. In a month, I'm going to do five freaking cities, bro. Like, these are things, as artists, we always dream about. And I'm so grateful for this, man. Danica, Dab, Dream More. Y'all know what it is, man. You guys are family for life. You guys are a part of me. Definitely. I would have to hold off uh, this one question for now uh, because we might do, like, a next interview, like, coming soon and all that. But to end it off, uh, what's uh, next for you aside from the tour and everything else? And do you have any final words you'd like to say for any artist or any person out there pursuing their dreams? For me, personally, um, I believe the one person with the most amount of hours will always trump any type of gift or any type of like genetic advantage. It don't matter. I have implemented so many hours into this craft. You guys have no idea. I've put so much money, thought, intention, and purpose into what I do. And this only comes with time. I am at a place where I know what my brand is and I know what I bring. That's, that's only through experience. It, trust me. In April, I'll be dropping my very first EP. I won't give you guys the name. Within the next three weeks, I'm going to drop another single. I will also not give you guys the name. 
<laughs> yo, I, I, we got to do this again, bro. Yeah, we got to do this again, bro. Conversation to speak on it. No. <laughs> you know, I have a podcast too, so you know, I'd definitely like invite you like on the podcast and all that. <laughs> Maybe even do like part two on the podcast, you know, either way. But uh, absolutely, you know, Dolo, man. you know, thank you for coming by for your very first Tilo Y interview. You know, you spoke a lot of facts. You know, you gave your life story. You spoke like a lot, like for a bit too. And you know, I'm glad to even like have this uh, with you to share that story to give that whole meaning and all that and you know if artists like you you're paving the way for like the sound of like rap and afro and afro beats and r&b and everything else too and you know you're leading in a good cause too so i'm always going to give you your flowers regardless on what you're doing for the city and like the impact you're having and all that and you know I wish nothing but the best either way, you know. Thank you. Last thing I got to say, uh, I got to give a shout out to Rise as well. They've been a big pillar in my community. Uh, sorry, in my, they've been a big pillar in the community and in also in my artistry as well. And for the new artist, bro, as hard as it may seem, just stay true to yourself. Yeah. It's cliche, bro. Don't change for nobody because it'll hurt. Don't change for nobody. It'll hurt. And always, oh, wow, oh, wow. Man, Jeez. you know, Dolo, until next time, man. Yeah.